we are now live, we are now live on Zoom and live on YouTube. So thank you for attending our new webinar. I hope you had all a safe uh, 4th of July weekend and some fun despite the situation. My name is Jean-Baptiste Piron and together with Alain Charbonnier, we are co-founder of the Belgian Business Club in Los Angeles. For those of you who don't know our club yet, we help Belgium entrepreneurs and uh, executives to connect with the right professionals in the regions to stimulate business and enable networking. So today we will talk about immigration and travel topics that affects us all, unfortunately. In the past weeks, we saw a lot of changes in the regulations that enable us to work, study and travel and basically move freely between the US and Europe. And with the recent development of uh, the, the regulation and the, and, the, and the travel ban in the world, we wanted to bring you a view on the current situation, the possible future changes, and since this is a very emotional topic, give you a clear facts on what is possible to do for you. We have participants from all over the US and from Europe today, thank you very much. And we receive a lot of questions in advance. We will do our best to cover most of your inquiries during the talk. And some situations are more complex than others. So if you feel that your questions were not totally covered, you will be able to contact our experts after the session. The contact details will be provided on our last slide. But let's jump to the program today. So joining us from all California, I'm very happy and honored to welcome the panelists. Lorraine D'Alessio first. Lorraine is an immigration attorney and has a great team of very talented people, including uh, people here on, the, on this uh, webinar, helping a lot of immigration, immigrants and non-immigrants with a range of visas and with a specialty on E2 and O1 visa. Solange Kassianov, uh, who will join us by audio today because we had some technical video issue, sorry for that. Solange is Deputy Consul General of Belgium here in Los Angeles. The consulate is helping Belgians and non-Belgians on consular affairs in 13 states and two territories from Guam to Colorado. Alain Missoul, Alain is the president of the Belgium Socal Club of Southern California. And the club is organizing great events all over the year for Belgium and France. And Pierre Smith, Pierre is like Alain, president of a Belgian club, but the one of Northern California. Both are living in the US since a long time and are animating the Belgian community in California. Thank you all for your time and flexibility for our attendees. We will start to cover the US visa and travel restriction with Lorraine. Then we will continue with Solange for the European travel restriction. Alain and Pierre will also inform you on their activities for the local Belgium community. After each keynote of Lorraine and Solange, we will have a Q&A session. If you have questions that are not covered in the presentation, you may use the Q&A chat box if you are connected on Zoom. We will ask to our expert your questions. For those who follow us on YouTube Live, do not hesitate to reach us by email after the session if you still have questions. So we we'll start with Lorraine. Lorraine, the floor is yours. Lorraine, we cannot hear you. Your mic is off. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, yeah, it's good. Uh, bonjour, it's uh, such a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you so much for having me and uh, Delessio Law Group. Um, uh, well, there's been quite a bit of movement in U.S. immigration currently, so um, I think I will just jump right in. Um, but we, uh, we are an award-winning immigration law firm, one of the top in the country, and so happy to help you. We have a particular expertise uh, with Belgium and also Western Europe coming into the U.S. back and forth. So, all right. Um, so, uh, President Trump um, announced a proclamation on 
April 23rd that temporarily blocked the issuance of green cards to foreign national that are outside of the United States, but includes several exceptions. So I think what I will do in this presentation to really kick off um, with some of the current changes that we're seeing in immigration um, and then um, and then also go over some of the very commonly used um, visa types um, for um, people that are coming in from Belgium um, or already in the United States and maintaining their status. So, um, so the proclamation as of April 23rd, um, it, it um, was really shocking, of course, for um, the international community when, when this was absorbed, as um, we weren't quite sure exactly from the tweet what this meant, as he talked about cancelling all of immigration. Um, in fact, if you are a legal expert, you know that the president really does not have that power. Um, with the system of checks and balances in the U.S. Constitution, it is virtually impossible um, for the president to cancel um, immigration. So, um, so what indeed did he do? So he really um, was focused on the first, uh, um, April 23rd, on um, blocking the issuance of green cards for foreign nationals that are outside the United States. So those would be people that had not maintained another non-immigrant visa working status or any other type of status in the US that would allow them to go back and forth um, to and fro um, or to be currently in the United States while they adjust to the green card. So it would be those from outside. Um, however, um, the interesting thing about this first order is that people are actually already blocked um, from, uh, from coming into the United States anyway, because the consulates and the embassies are closed. So if you are doing a green card process, you are required from outside, you are required to do an interview um, from outside. And so this is, um, uh, uh, it's quite an interesting order since the temporary blockage, it, the people were already blocked anyway. So, um, so this is interesting to, to take note of and also on the, on the, on the lack or the, the impact or the lack of the impact since they already were impacted. Anyway, um, President Trump then renewed um, uh, his uh, proclamation <clears throat> um, on June 22nd, that's the last week, Monday, um, with additional extensions onto that um, uh, order, um, blocking now, this time, certain visa classifications. Um, and that included restrictions onto H1B, H2B, L1, and J1, um, with many, a long list of exceptions actually as well. Um, and so what he um, was actually um, really targeting is that if the foreign national, if those that are outside of the United States did not have any other type of status keeping them into the United States, that there would be restrictions that would be applied to them in, in terms of um, being able to enter the United States and work on the H-1B, H-2B, L-1, and J-1. So, however, at the same time, um, th this, um, this order will be reevaluated every 60 days. And, um, and from what we can definitely see from the current administration, there is so much change and a lot of political rhetoric as well and fear mongering for the immigration community. And so it is likely to definite, to, it is likely um, to change as well. Um, so ev even though right now the rhetoric is um, indeed that there are going to be restrictions and indeed we have the order, um, those the mod there very well could be modifications onto this. Um, so, um, who um, if so if you are currently in the United States on an active work visa or are a permanent resident green card holder currently in the United States, those restrictions do not apply to you. Also, as a foreign national who who have planned on entering um, in um, 2021 on an H1B who perhaps was a beneficiary of uh, the lottery for H1B um, this year. Um, unfortunately, those H1B visa holder, um, those H1B candidates would not be able to um, likely look at entering this year for October 1st. However, um, that doesn't mean that they've lost their spot. It just means that currently it is on hold. So then we could be look, definitely looking at reevaluating this um, for, the, for the coming months. Um, so we have to stay tuned. Um, the diversity lottery is also suspended, um, and those um, are, you know, 50,000 green cards that are available to um, foreign nationals around the world um, to come 
countries with really low immigration to the United States. Um, but many, many people apply every year for that. But unfortunately, currently it is suspended. Um, also, I will move on to um, um, routine visa services at all U.S. embassies and consular po posts are um, suspended as of March 20th, um, but are being slowly now reopened um, in um, certain field offices, asylum cases as well, for non-emergency services. Um, this is really key because for anyone who is looking at um, entering, say, for example, you've begun an E-1 or an E-2 visa, which is not affected by the President's proclamations um, orders, um, you could actually actually uh, start initiating your interview and entering the United States. USCIS also continues to process visas. So those are the service centers from within the United States and perform um, really their duties um, that, do, that do not involve contact or in-person appointments. But actually, as of uh, June 5th, we are seeing the opening now of in-person um, meetings and, um, and even hearings um, for the courts. Um, and so we're starting indeed now to see that reopening even for the service centers um, internally in the US. So including renewals, um, ESTA, the Visa Waiver Program, B1, B2 um, visas, you can indeed um, look at um, doing an extension onto that status, even though traditionally ESTA, um, the Visa Waiver Program, has never permitted extensions. Um, our firm actually um, has received even up to three um, extensions onto ESTA um, due to impact on COVID. And it's really important to be able to show that nexus of how you have been affected by COVID, if that is indeed your travel or even medical. And we definitely expect possible closings again, dependent on new COVID updates. But as of right now, this is the status. Um, also, the entry of individuals who were present in China, Iran, European Schengen area, so very relevant to our conversation today and those in the audience, um, the UK, Ireland, and Brazil during the last 14-day period will not be allowed to enter the United States, and, and this has been suspended. Um, however, what that means is that you could be traveling to a non-Schengen um, country there for at least 14 days and then permitted to enter the United States. And that is certainly what people have been doing. Um, US citizens and permanent residents are exempt from these travel restrictions and non-immigrant holders still are still subject um, to restrictions based on country. Um, so the US um, and, and Mexican border, so some people may consider, well, what if I were to travel to Canada or Mexico and come through this way? But unfortunately, the US border with Canada and Mexico is also closed to non-essential travel until at least mid-July. So citizens are allowed to return um, you know, um, citizens are really the ones that are allowed to return home to their home countries, but there are um, indeed restrictions um, because of that um, closure until mid-July. So um, I would also say that in terms of the exceptions, going back to President Trump's um, proclamation and his newest, uh, his most updated proclamation as of um, July, uh, July 22nd, June 22nd, sorry. Um, these, uh, these restrictions really apply to foreign nationals that are currently in the process of pursuing the H-1B, um, H-2B, J-1 or L-1 and are currently outside the United States. So if you are currently in the United States through a previous H-1B, a non-agricultural worker, H to be L1, J1. This news really does not apply to your current status, um, though it could potentially for, for, for future uh, petitions. Um, the news does not affect um, green card holders, lawful permanent residents of the United States, their spouses, children um, of, the, uh, of a U.S. citizen, and really any foreign um, national that is seeking to enter the United States to provide um, temporary labor or services essential to the United States food supply chain or foreign um, professionals whose entry would be in the national interest. So this is, this is um, including those that are um, uh, providing essential services um, during COVID as well, medical services um, that are exempt, um, physicians, nurses, other healthcare professionals, and see those seeking to perform medical research as well to combat COVID. 
Um, so if, 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 um, so it does indeed target this latest extension on the order, particularly those that are the recipients of the H1B and, 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 um, find themselves outside and we're planning to come in. Um, I also find that who it affects are people that are, unfortunately have already been impacted by COVID. And so we're not able to file in time their L1 visa or perhaps, um, uh, you know, their, their H1B may be due to their restrictions in travel for themselves or their restrictions, um, just generally speaking. And so, um, so unfortunately, those I, in our consultations and um, those that we have talked to on a daily basis, this, these are the two groups that we note have been most affected. However, um, we also do note that um, uh, companies, founders, CEOs have been very um, good about um, getting in touch with us and we are strategizing on other options to keep their teams together, retain their teams. And for those that are of specialized knowledge or essential to their um, uh, to their to their team and retaining their group, um, there have been other options to look at. And <clears throat> I list out in this on this slide um, several um, uh, several options: um, the O1, the E1, the E2 visa. And I'm going to go through each one and what they what they essentially mean. Um, so. Um, if you if you have been affected by um, the U.S. visa restrictions, it would be prudent really to pursue alternatives and sometimes multiple really immigration strategies at the same time. Um, the ONA visa is for individuals with an extraordinary ability in the sciences, education, business, tech, or athletics. Um, I also just wanted to check before I get into um, the details of this um, that, um, okay, good, perfect. You can see that. Perfect, perfect. Okay. Um, so, a lot of people are, get quite confused as to what um, the O-1 visa even is. Um, and, um, you know, those that read the regulations tend to feel that um, the O-1 is reserved for people that are at the very, very top of their field, um, that small percentage, and they may not, um, you know, ever be <laughs> eligible or it could take them, you know, many, many years to, to become available and, um, you know, I, I, to become eligible. So. Um, but that is really, um, if you really look at in practice how this visa has actually rolled out and the, the types of candidates have been able to achieve, it, achieve this visa over the years, you're really looking at a distinction, a distinction that people have in the field, that there's something about them that has caused them to stand out as per others in the field, something niche, and this could be in business, it could be in entertainment, it could be in technology. Um, and, and so then it becomes a little bit less um, intimidating. And when you actually look at the, the criteria for the extraordinary ability, you see that um, this is really digging um, into what the professionals have as per their portfolios, um, what kind of articles that they've published, um, have they ha been attached to any patents, um, have, um, have they um, been a part of any memberships or associations that, you know, re require a standing achievement to be members of them, have they been invited to them, have they spoken on panels or conferences, um, and some Certainly, um, I find that for a lot of consultations that I do for people that are, you know, executives and founders and CEOs or those that are within an organization but highly specialized in what they do, many of them qu actually qualify and don't even realize that they do. And what's really nice about the O-1 visa is that you can actually apply for it at any time of year, unlike that H-1B visa, which is for degreed professionals that are coming in to do it degree type job. And um, there, there's really a very small window for that filing, which is April 1st um, every, every year. And there's less than 30% chance of even getting them. That doesn't mean that companies don't try to get the H-1B for, um, you know, and put their employees on that track. And it definitely has been an important HR strategy for many very prudent HR directors. Um, but it's really good to also try out the O-1 to see whether they might qualify, even filing multiple petitions at the same time. Um, and, um, and if they do, then they're on a three-year renewable track for a working permit um, and can, you know, be renewed indefinitely. Um, so it is a good one to take a look at, and this has been processing just fine uh, with USCIS the entire time. And if you have a no one visa and the stamp and the passport, you can travel to and from the United States, even 
um, uh, even with all the, the COVID, you know, extra, you know, um, checks that we have in place. Um, also, what's not been affected by, and, and, and I would say that the um, administration has been quite vocal about um, supporting a merits-based immigration system, which um, extraordinary ability is uh, very, very uh, first and foremost on that, um, as and and that's why indeed I would say that we probably haven't seen them tamper at all with it. Um, at no movements. Um, a couple of years back, there were about seventy three thousand applications just in one year. Actually, that was processed. So that's important to note. Um, as well, um, they um, we had um, earlier this year um, when COVID first hit, of course, um, that um, Trump made it quite clear that he's here to support also the investor community too. And we see that as, you know, with this order, he has not touched the E1 and the E2 visa, which of course Belgium citizens um, <laughs> know very well about. And this is um, really for an opportunity to set up a new office in the United States or extend your um, company into the US, but, but it's not required to have anything functioning in the home country. And what's quite interesting about the e-visa is it requires a very low threshold of investment uh, it tends to be about 100 to 150,000 um, for for that principal investor investor or if there's two principal investors to come in and get set up and then even it provides the option of registering the company at the at the uh, consulate level and to be able to transfer in other employees into the US so it's um, it's great that this one has not been touched and there are even um, expedite options available um, that um, you know within even a week um, one can turn around an e visa and there's a couple um, a couple of ports that allow you to actually do this so um, and I would also say what's quite interesting about the administration not, uh, you know, keep protecting this option is that that there are so, you know, with COVID, there's a lot of people that are entrepreneurs um, tend to be thinking about new business ideas, um, looking at the challenges that COVID presents, and then um, you know, developing new businesses that could respond to the new, the changes in the market. And so, you know, the E1 is really the, sorry, the E2 visa is, is in, in particular, is speaks to um, uh, the opportunity to really set up that new office and get things moving um, with a business plan. Um, an economic development program, if you will, even though that could be at a very small level or a medium or large. So I, I think that this is a, a quite good um, for the community. This is positive positive news and um, and, it, and it, it definitely shows that um, the administration really has has no intention to to slow that processing down at all so the um, the I just wanted to note that the extraordinary abilities route does have a green card uh, route attached as well and if you in fact satisfy the criteria for the O1 you can even look at um, further building the application with even just an additional four criteria um, which you don't have to all have um, every single one of them, but at least some, um, that um, that you can actually even go for the permanent uh, green card route as well. Um, there is also um, the EB1C, and this is this could be quite helpful for those that are, um, you know, owning companies or an executive in company or manager in company, supervisor in company, that you that that uh, you could be going straight for the green card as well. And what's so great about the EB1A extraordinary ability EB1C is that these can be through intracorporate transfer is that these can be processed in um, a year to a year and a half. Um, there has been some backlog. However, um, it, it is, um, it's, it's a great way to quickly, um, you know, get that processed and not be in a, a subject to very long wait times via, via visa, the visa uh, bulletin um, that comes out regularly. So the, um, the L1, as we have talked about, is currently um, you know, um, uh, experiencing um, a hold right now due to the administration's order, um, but um, the EB1C has not. So um, you could actually begin that green card process um, and, you know, take steps to protect yourself should there be any further changes, but we don't think so in terms of the investor route. 
So I, I know this was a very quick overview and I talked really quickly <laughs> um, about all of the updates, um, all of the major updates that we are seeing. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's one really big one that I didn't spend much time, um, I, didn't, I didn't spend time talking about, but I do want to briefly close with, and that is um, the Supreme Court's ruling on DACA, which is for the dreamers. Um, these are for those that enter the country illegally as young children um, and um, have been in the United States for a certain amount of time that the, uh, that the, uh, um, the Supreme Court has ruled that the administration um, cannot, um, that, the, that, it, that they, they cannot be canceled, that this program cannot be canceled and that their attempt to, be, to cancel it was in fact unreasonable um, and goes against the US Constitution. And I, I just wanna take a moment to highlight it because uh, the, the, the decision itself may or may not actually affect this community that is listening in right now um, to this webinar, um, it could, it, 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 for yourselves personally, but you could have um, people on your team that are, are dreamers. But I think that what we take away um, from that ruling um, from the Supreme Court is that um, immigration is here to stay. And the reason why it is here to stay is um, because we have a system of checks and balances. And, um, you know, we don't, we do not have a system where the president can just, um, uh, you know, with 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 one tweet, um, you know, go about um, yeah, um, taking away important um, uh, avenues for people to enter the United States, operate in the United States, do business with the United States, and protect their business interests. So, um, so I would say that um, it, it's it's quite uh, it's something that people should definitely be recognized and feel encouraged about. I certainly uh, felt very very happy that I acquired U.S. citizenship through. Um, anyway. But um, I, I do um, would like for anyone who has case specific questions to please reach out to us on a consultation basis. We are so happy to help. And thank you so much um, for the time that uh, I've had today to speak with you. Thank you so much, Lorraine. And thank you for your quick but very complete overview of the situation. And don't leave us <laughs> because we have a lot of questions. Sure. And I would like to Pierre uh, from the Belgium Club of Northern California to to ask the first question uh, he received previously by email. If you, if you are ready, Pierre, to, to ask Lauren the question you received, if you don't mind. Yes, I'm ready. Good, mo good, good afternoon, how are you doing? Good. Uh, I have a, the question here is from uh, uh, Frederick. Uh, he is uh, saying the following. I'm a professor from Namur and I have been in Davis since the late February on a six month sabbatical uh, with a G1 uh, visa. Unfortunately, the pandemic happened and we decided to stay away. Uh, we, we decided to stay anyway because uh, we have uh, not the opportunity to come back next year. In the past few weeks, I have been contacting people at the embassy and other acquaintances regarding my son. He is supposed to come visit us in July on the 8th. Uh, it has been postponed from the Easter holiday already. He is 14 years old and it's been four months I haven't seen him. Uh, as the ban from the EU visitors has not been lifted yet, we are looking for the best advices to make decision on his coming this week. Any help and advices will be appreciated. Yes, of course. Um, so I would recommend that he actually um, contact me directly and we have a fuller, at least 20 to 30 minute conversation about his situation because there's a lot in there that should be addressed. That's very, very case specific. Um, so I will start off by saying that. Um, but in terms of his son and being able to see his son, um, you know, obviously um, coming through a non Schengen country um, is definitely a, a absolutely an option. Um, which country, which port, how he does it, and what his what um, if he ha might have a B1, B2 or, or um, you know, currently um, access to ESTA are all questions that need to be asked in that conversation. So, um, so I, I would say that there is, there is definitely options. Um, however, we would want to have a one-on-one -on, -one on that one. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you, Lorraine. Um, I have a lot of questions in the Q&A box. I will try to, to cover the majority of them. So, uh, please excuse us if we cannot address all the questions and we, you will be able to contact uh, Lorraine uh, separately after. So 
I have a question from Mathieu. Uh, he's currently in Belgium. And is he's looking for an unpaid internship in the US for the period September to December. Uh, he's an international student in business. Do you think that it will be possible to do that internship in September or not? Well, currently, I need to know um, currently what what is currently his status at the present time? Do we do we know? Is he a visitor or? I think he's currently in Belgium, so I don't okay. think he has a status in the U.S. right now. So internships come under the um, J-1 visa, and so the the J-1 is 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 the internship um, uh, visa. So um, so interns and trainees. Unfortunately, that is subject to the order, um, Trump's order, where he is putting things on hold there. Um, however. However, it's not forever, it's just temporary. Um, so um, we can certainly, we should certainly talk with him because there could actually be another option for him um, outside of the J1. And if I had his resume or his LinkedIn, I could certainly go over what those would be. Thank you. Uh, I have another question related from Sabrina. Uh, I have I might have missed it, but my husband has a, a, G, a, G2, a J2 visa for the period 2020, but could not join me fast enough in the USA. I've been under my J1 visa since January, and we wanted to know if he will be able to cross the border if he boarded the plane. Okay, so I need to check his passport and look at his stamp and make sure that he's um, that he the stamp is valid and and that is all fine. Um, um, the, the issue will be the bigger issue will be is that the fact that he spent the last fourteen days in a Schengen country. So um, so that has not been lifted. So he would not be able to come straight through. So it would be go to go to a non Schengen country, quarantine there, and then come in. So um, and but again, this is very case specific um, guidance, um, which would require a, a consultation. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, something linked as well. Any updates on when F1 visa interviews at embassies around the world will go ahead, hopefully before fall 2020? Indeed, hopefully. Um, we have definitely had reports. I've had reports from, from our clients actually um, indicating that, um, and, and we certainly have been involved in some scheduling as well, um, that the interviews are being scheduled, um, but in terms of them actually occurring yet, um, that is yet to be reported. But um, the DS-160 applications to go ahead and begin the application process have indeed um, uh, been initiated. Okay, thank you. And the last one received in the Q&A box before we are moving to the European topic. Um, what about the visa I, the media visa? I'm outside the US right now, but I need to be back soon in California. Can I cross the border without the actual travel ban, with the media uh, visa, the I visa? And, and what, sorry, what, what country are they currently residing Belgium. in? Belgium. Yeah. So again, um, that 14 day issue is, is an issue. Um, and, um, but the I visa, there are currently no restrictions on that, that visa. So, um, so if it's already um, obtained and the visa is already there, um, then um, that should not be an issue. Okay. Thank you so much. Again, I, I would really highly encourage before any travel is made into the U.S. that you speak with um, an immigration expert and um, I would be happy to help. Yeah, definitely. And we will share the, the contact details of Lorraine and all the panelists at the end of the session. And uh, Alain, do you have any question coming from Southern California, Belgium community or, or not? Um, so. Yeah, so, so the, one of the questions is, um, one of our members has a U.S. visa. I'm sorry, a U.S. passport and a Belgian passport. They have dual nationality. Are there any travel restrictions for them at all, going to Europe and coming back? No, um, only the 14-day issue um, for Schengen okay. countries. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we might have some other questions coming in for for U.S. visa and travel restriction. So. As I said, I recommend to reach out to, to Lauren separately. And now we will move to, to the Consul General of Belgium, Consul General of Belgium. And Solange will uh, um, give, give us an, an overview of what's happening currently in Europe, basically in Belgium, but uh, all over in Europe. So Solange, are you there? Yes, thank you, Jean-Baptiste. We will, we will pass your, your, your slide right now. So. 
Just All a right. moment. So hello everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in this webinar. I'm sorry that uh, uh, we cannot see each other. Um, the technic decided uh, something else. But um, so I'm going to speak to you, uh, and I will be happy to clarify who is able to travel to Belgium from the U.S. at the moment. Uh, I will speak to you about the temporary travel restriction due to COVID-19, which is still in place in Europe, and the European Council recommendation that European member states adopted on June 30th, and that allows countries from the EU and Schengen zone to allow non-essential travel from 14 countries outside the EU as of the 1st of July. So as you uh, already knew, the U.S. is not part of the list. But you have to know that this list was drawn up based on objective criteria related to the epidemiological situation and containment uh, measures, and that due to the rapid evolution of the pandemic, this list will be reviewed every 15 days. So to make things easier, let's agree that when speaking about EU, it also includes the Schengen associated countries, which are Switzerland, Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein, and we will call the rest third countries, if you don't mind. Um, I would also uh, wish to add uh, that even though the United Kingdom left the EU end of January uh, this year, it remains bound by EU rules as we are still in a transition period that will normally run until the end of 2020. So they are still considered as EU citizens. It's a bit confusing because there are some EU states uh, that are not part of the Schengen area. Uh, I will not go into details, but you have to know that border controls with uh, non-Schengen countries have been strengthened. So, for instance, a U.S. citizen traveling uh, uh, through the U.K. or Croatia will have to comply with the essential travel criteria to be able to enter uh, Belgium. So we will see um, the entire list later on uh, of the defined essential criteria. Um, so what I can tell you that in a in addition to this list of 14 countries, the list of travelers with an essential function or need who are allowed to travel despite the, the restrictions has been broadened to three categories. The first one, and I think is uh, the most relevant one for, or interesting one for a lot of people, is um, EU citizens and third country national legally staying in the EU as well as their respective family members, whether they return home or not. While before, the exception for EU citizens and their family members and third country nationals was limited to the purposes of returning to their homes. Uh, the second category is third country nationals traveling for the purpose of study, and the third category, um, highly qualified third country workers if their employment is necessary for, from an economic perspective and the work cannot be postponed or performed abroad. So now I will, um, I will tell you what we exactly mean by family member as defined in a European Commission directive. Uh, so the family members are the spouse, the partner with whom a registered partnership has been officially contracted, uh, so I'm very sorry we received a lot of questions um, about my fiancé, my girlfriend, boyfriend. This will not be possible. Um, so the direct descendants also who are under the age of 21 or are still dependents and the dependent directly relatives in the ascending line. Um, so please note that when traveling, the family members must be able to demonstrate their relationship to the EU family member with official documentation, like, uh, for instance, a marriage or a birth certificate. Uh, um, this will be uh, required. 
Um, since the start of the pandemic, Belgian citizens and holders of residence permit for Belgium have been, all, uh, have been allowed to travel back to Belgium, and this will continue, of course, to be the case. Uh, so what, in practical terms, what is changing from the 1st of July 2020? The Belgian government made a cautious start towards this reopening in this initial stage. And until further notice, Belgium makes no distinction between these 14 countries and the others, as practical modalities are still under development. This means that the, the visa activity is limited to the categories of travelers with an essential function or need. And I don't know if you can see uh, on the slide, there, is, um, there are 11 categories. Um, I will not name them all, but uh, you can see that uh, they are all there. Uh, and our consulate uh, general and the other Belgian consular missions in the U.S. started uh, accepting visa application for those categories that are exempt from the travel restriction. So um, also for the time being, visa application for the purpose of family reunification can be submitted again, but we do not have the green light yet to deliver any visa in this framework. Um, well, so I would like also to point out that upon arrival, uh, there is also a 14-day quarantine that must be respected. And there is uh, also a form that uh, people will have to fill in. It's a document that you have to fill in before you board. This document is called Public Health Passenger Locator Form, and it is considered a, really a condition for entry. So this form um, should be given to the border officer at your point of entry in Belgium. The, the, in this form, there are several information like, um, you know, so you have to provide an address where you are going to quarantine, a telephone number, so, uh, the details of your flights, the seats that you occupy during the flight, and so on. Um, yeah, and that's about it. I would like to conclude by saying that travelers are, in any case, advised to inform themselves well in advance of each trip about the measures to be taken in the country of destination, because it's still possible that some countries impose measures such as a COVID test or a quarantine. So please contact your airline and the embassy of the countries you will be transiting through if you are traveling to Belgium through a neighboring country. Uh, you have to check with which exact documentation is required to travel uh, or to cross borders. Uh, if, you, if your travel is not really needed, uh, I would recommend to be cautious uh, because it's still very complicated. There are still flights that are being canceled. So please take all known precautionary measures so that you can travel in the safest possible way. Um, Thank you. Yeah, that's, thank you, Solange. Be my advice. Yeah, thank you so much, Solange. Uh, I, I would like to add as well, if you have non-essential travel to do, don't do that. Uh, please refrain to do that. Uh, it's, it's better to stay where you are right now if you don't need to travel. And uh, as a general rule, I think it's, it's better. Um, we have a lot, lot, lots of questions, even more than <laughs> Lorraine. Um, uh, and we receive a lot of questions in advance by email. And I would like, like for Lorraine to start with Pierre, uh, who has received from the, the Club of Northern California some questions for Solange. Solange, um, we have a question from Roger. Uh, he is asking, we were supposed to go to Belgium in March, but our flight were canceled because of the virus. We're hoping to be able to go later this year, September or October. Do you have any idea if this will be possible? Do we have to do anything in order to be able to travel? I do my medical follow-ups in Belgium still, normally twice a year, but I would like to do it at least once a year. And I have a dual citizenship. So dual citizenship, US and Belgium? Yes. 
So yes, of course, uh, Belgian citizens have always been able to go back to Belgium, um, and they won't even if he is not his. He doesn't have his residence there. There is no problem about that, as long as he has a he is um, with his Belgian passport, and um, there will be no problem. Okay. I have another question from uh, Stephen. My wife is off to Belgium. She just left yesterday. I want to join her in about a month. Uh, so my questions are related to my trip. Can a non-Belgian citizen or non-Belgian resident travel to Belgium to reunite with a family member? And if so, can this person be a US citizen or resident? and or must be a European citizen or a resident of an, appro of, of an approved country. What document do I need to, to present to the airline or how do I obtain this? This concern is uh, that the airline will not know all the rules and may incorrectly deny boarding. Mm -hmm. For your information, the wife is Belgian, U.S. and New Zealand citizen, and the husband is a U.S. and New Zealand citizen. Yes, yeah, so it's not the nationality, it is the, the, the residence in the third country uh, which determine the lifting of the temporary uh, restriction. So, um, yes, in the, you will see that in those uh, 11 categories, there is the the family member as defined in the European Commission directive that says that uh, the third country national can join the EU citizen. Okay. So it is part of the exception, it would be accepted. But then the, the, what you would have to present is a marriage certificate. Um, apart from that, yeah, any any useful documentation can be brought, but I, I think what it is really important is to contact the airlines before, of course, because about all those interpretation, we don't know if uh, there won't be any problem. You have to be cautious and, and uh, check this in advance. One of the things he mentioned is that the marriage certificate does not include the citizenship. No, but he has uh, the, the, he has the passport, and then um, it's not the citizenship. He's coming from the U.S. He, he he is here in the U.S. So to be able to go to to Belgium, he doesn't have to prove his citizenship. He has to prove the citizenship of the the spouse, and so the passport, a copy of the passport, that would be enough. And with the marriage certificate, it would be the proof that he is uh, married to this person. Okay. Okay, thank you. We have some questions we received live, Solange. So mm -hmm. one question from uh, an anonymous attendee. Does Belgium <laughs> have any plans to allow mail-in applications for Belgian Schengen visas once tourism restarts? With COVID and the world going global, it is a lot of trouble for to be tourists like myself to go to the consulate to submit my, my application. So it's more like regarding organization. So uh, there is any plan for the Belgium consulate in the US and around the world to, to allow mailing application for visas? So we uh, mainly receive uh, visa application by mail. Uh, to avoid contacts, but this is only possible for long-term visa. For a short-term visa, if this person uh, comply with the, um, or is part of the 11 categories, uh, this person will have to come because uh, for short-stay visa, um, you need to appear and give your biometrics unless um, you have been you had um, a prior visa application in the last uh, three years, I think. Uh, that would be, yeah, you should contact us in advance and we would see uh, how we could organize it. 
Okay. It's a case by case. Uh, yeah, sure. We have another question from Antoine, and I think I will answer to it. Otherwise, you, you will uh, add something, Solange. Do we need to contact the Belgium consulate in California to get authorization to travel to Europe? I would say if you are Belgium, of course not, because you, you can, of course, enter into your country. Uh, sure. at the time. So it depends on, on your nationality and your status, of course. So we will need some more information about that. Um, I have another question. Um, it's linked to the, um, the health um, more. Is it possible to get tested for COVID-19 four days after landing in Belgium and shorten the two-week quarantine if we are traveling for a family emergency? Well, there is some. There are some exceptions uh, when you when you travel for emergencies like uh, a disease. It's considered essential, and we know that, uh, for instance, someone who would travel to attend a funeral would not have, to, of course, to um, quarantine. Uh, he would be able to attend, and but will will not be able to gather with the people, uh, and then he will have to respect the, the quarantine. So there are some expect, uh, exceptions about this, but uh, I would have to know, of course, the reason, uh, the emergency reason. We have another question from Eva. Um, I'm a Belgian living in the US with a green card, and my husband is a US citizen. I understand that we are allowed to travel to Belgium now to take care of family matters. However, did I understand correctly that we will not, will not be allowed back in the US unless we first spend 14 days in a non-Schengen country? Um, as it was already answered, they mm -hmm. can come back, I think, with a green card and we'll, they will have to they will have to respect uh, the quarantine. So I don't really understand the question. So Eva, if you have more questions, reach out to, con to the consulate. I think it would be better to explain your exact situation. This is, this is what makes everything very complicated because you have to quarantine on, when you, on your way out and on your way back. So it uh, makes things very difficult. Uh, we have also a question regarding visa, the D-type visa. So only specific type of single permit workers are being issued a D visa. Can you share more on this aspect? What are the differences and when can the other types of single permit types of workers be able to receive their visa? Yes, so it's, it's only at the moment for highly qualified uh, third country workers. Uh, as uh, noted in the the list, um, so it depends really. We have um, it's very recent. I received the information today that we have a special code. When we receive the the copy of the single permit, this code will will tell us if we can issue the visa or if we have to post postpone. Okay. We have uh, another question. Sorry, Solange, there was a question okay. from David. Um, I, um, just a moment. Uh, we are living in the US, have a Belgian passport. Are there any issues with traveling to the UK for a sabbatical? Um, and uh, the spouse of David is a professor who will perform our research in Scotland. Well, I would prefer not to answer to that question, I would just uh, advise them to directly uh, address themselves to the UK authorities. Yes, I would I not take the responsibility, yes. Sure, sure. Um, just a moment, I check the, the question we have. I think it's a very uh, the question was answered before, but the question from Olivier. I'm a Belgium citizen staying in the US with residence in Belgium. Can I travel with my wife, a US citizen, to Belgium? We are married in the US. So, yes. Yeah. This is a yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, a question on the type D visa as well. Let me, let me read it first. 
I send my tag D visa application at the Belgian Consulate General in New York in March. I got my work permit to be an au pair study French at a language school, but am I still not considered an exception as a student or worker? Do you know when type D visa will begin again? Uh, au pair, um, I would have to see the documentation if she is a, a student. What kind of student is this? Uh, this is a bit difficult to answer without the details. Um, I would say yes, we have to assess uh, that kind of application. Sure. Uh, a question related to um, L1 visa, I think it's uh, more for, for Lauren. Um, I send this question to you. In, yeah. We are a Belgian family living in the, in the US on L1 visa. Can we go to Belgium to visit family? And more important, can we return to the US after the visit? Um, I didn't hear the last part of the question, but the first part of the question is absolutely. Um, yeah. You can leave, but I would not recommend it right now. I would not recommend leaving. I would recommend staying. So the, the, whatever the reasons are for leaving, um, I'd want to talk with them about. Um, again, they're revising these rules like every 60 days. So I just, um, I think, you know, better be on the conservative side. What is the second part of the question? Um, is we, uh, can we go to Belgium to visit family? And more important, can we return to the US uh, for the whole family after the visit? And they um, are all on, uh, on their L1 visa. Yes, um, yes you can. Um, always, 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 uh, the Immigration Council should be looking at the reciprocity, um, and, um, but the, knowing that it's quite long between the relationship, treaty relationship reciprocity between the US and Belgium, um, the stamps and the passport should be valid but I'd want to actually look at them myself because if they are not or they've run out or there any issue with them, then they have to make a stop at the embassy before they come back in. So it's not an issue to do that. It just adds an extra layer of um, you know, wait time there because the embassies, uh, of course, are closed, are, are, are reopening, but reopening very slowly. So it's not that they can't come back. It's just that if the stamps are not uh, valid currently, they'll have to wait to get the interview before they come in. But they're likely still valid uh, because of the very long reciprocity relationship um, between um, Belgium and the US. Okay, but, but they, they, they do need to, to, um, to spend 14 days outside the Exactly. And then, as I've mentioned in the previous, yes, yeah. so, um, that still holds. Um, so I'd want to know how long they want to be in Belgium for, what the reasons are, and, um, you know, the timelines. So then, yeah, so th this would definitely be something that I would, I would recommend via one on one consultation. Sure. So Lange, I have another question for you. Um, mm -hmm. I contacted the Belgium consulate to get a long term Schengen visa for my wife. The consulate said they were not issuing any visa right now. My wife had her biometry done last year. Can the visa be issued with the biometry, biometrics uh, that she gave last year? And he's a Belgium and US citizen, the guy. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, the, the, the biometrics would be uh, still in our system. The thing is that we have no um, uh, permission to to deliver visa for reunification, uh, family reunification. Uh, so the the spouse would be able to travel, but for a maximum of three months. Uh, as you know, uh, U.S. citizens they don't need a visa to uh, to go to Belgium when. It is for a period less uh, than 90 days. Um, I don't know about uh, trying on on the spot to regular regular regularize. How do I say this? this um, uh, the situation. But normally, we always advise people. Uh, we used to before this crisis to um, advise people to travel on a D visa because sometimes the whole procedure can be over those 90 days and you don't want to be in a in a country where you are not uh, supposed to so 
I know now, of course, there are some uh, different uh, procedures and people who are uh, stranded, they can ask for a pro uh, prolongation of their visa when they are in Belgium. Uh, this I don't know how it happens uh, exactly. Um, but uh, So we will not be able to uh, deliver a D visa, but the person would be able to, to travel uh, as a family member of a EU citizen. Okay, and now I have uh, two questions regarding the C visa. I will group them. Um, I started my request for a C visa. How long might it take before it's approved? Once I get it, can I enter Belgium coming from the US? Um, I didn't really, uh, what type of visa? C, C like uh, Charlie. Okay. Uh, so a, a C visa can be delivered in a, in a, a couple of days or a week. Uh, of course, now we will have, I think, all of a sudden, a lot of work. So uh, I would say 10 days maximum. Uh, of course, this person must be uh, in the must be part of the 11 categories uh, defining essential function or need. Um, so it would be for three months, 90 days. A C visa is for three months. Yeah, that's it. Okay, and I have another part, uh, another question, but still regarding C visa. So my fiance is a Belgian national and I'm from the US. We have been separated for five months now. We have been together for the last five years and I've been traveled the world together. In that time, I lived in Brussels as I went to the university and I wish to go to Belgium to be together. So can I apply for a cohabitation visa type C, C like Charlie? Uh, yes. I, I will follow all the COVID requirements, obviously. Unfortunately, unfortunately not. Uh, so as defined in the, in the directive of the European Commission, uh, a family member is a partner with a registered partnership. Uh, this needs to be official. It's really a contract that you do and that has more or less the same va uh, value as a marriage. So if there is nothing, if there is not a registered partnership, there will, uh, th that will not be possible. There is no cohabitation visa that can be uh, delivered. Okay. And, and you, cannot, you will not be able to travel and, and, and try to apply there in Belgium. Sure. Uh, thank you, Solange. Uh, I will move maybe to Alain. Alain, if you have some questions uh, from your community, and you can also uh, present what you do here in Southern California with the club. Sure, thank you. Um, so one question that I have from Dominique is, um, I became a US citizen prior to the dual nationality being available. Can I reapply for, for my Belgian uh, citizenship so I can travel freely back to Europe? Oh, this, it, it depends uh, how this person had the Belgian nationality and how did he lost, uh, lose it. Um, I would have to get a bit more detail. Okay, I think, I think it was prior to, uh, I think at one time you couldn't have dual, dual nationality. Mm -hmm. But I don't think at this point you don't lose your Belgian nationality, no, right? Actually, if, if a person acquired another nationality, after uh, 2007, um, it was not uh, accepted, so you would lose the Belgian nationality. And now, to regain it, you have to regain it. You have to be living and be an official resident of Belgium for at least one year. Okay. Uh, next question is: uh, My my son was born. Uh, I have a Belgian uh, citizen, and my son is 19 years old. Can he still become a Belgian citizen, even though he was born in the U.S.? And so that's the same thing. Uh, if the parent was not born in the U.S., uh, if the parent was born in the U.S., the son would be uh, automatically Belgian. But if it's not the case, then uh, 
the son would be able to ask for the Belgian citizenship, but from Belgium. He would have to be a resident of Belgium to apply. Okay. And the last thing, so the Belgian Club of Southern California, we have uh, multiple events throughout the year, most of the time uh, social events. Uh, again, due to the uh, COVID-19, we we're kind of very limited. Uh, we actually had a a, a concert with uh, with a local uh, performance group called pa uh, Paris Chanson about a about a, about a month ago. We had about 230 uh, member or people show up for the concert. Again, it's a Zoom concert, and we're doing another one together with the Belgian Club. Actually, that's going to be sponsored by the Belgian Club of Chicago on July 17th at 5.30 Pacific time. Anybody wants to join, just send us an email or look on look for the invitation on Belgian Club SoCal on Facebook and or uh, Instagram. And that's it. Thank you so much for your attending. Thank you, Alain. Uh, Pierre, maybe you can, you can present your, the Club of the North, maybe? Yes, I have one more question if I can. Sure. Uh, this is a question from Antoine. His family is the father is a, cit a Belgian citizen, the wife is a U.S. citizen, the child is a U.S. citizen and Belgian, and then a, the second child is only a, a U.S. citizen. They live in California and they want to move for one year in Barcelona as a uh, uh, work for his company. Uh, what type of process does he need to go through? So. It's going to Barcelona, but it's a Belgian and uh, uh, a Belgian and a U.S. Uh, family. Yes, I, I will not be able to answer this. I would ask them to uh, address themselves directly to the Spanish authorities and uh, and check with them directly. Okay, thank you. So the Belgian uh, Club of Northern California, it's also a social club, just like the Southern California. And we do a lot of activities uh, like uh, the New Year celebration or the 4th of July, I'm sorry, the 21st of July, that's going to happen on the 19th. Uh, this year, we have been very limited uh, due to uh, COVID-19. And uh, we're planning on, uh, we have had a couple of events uh, with webinar, uh, Zoom conferences, and we are going to have more of those for right now. Uh, one including is on the, the 19th of uh, July. Uh, right now, the future, we, we're waiting to see what's going to happen. We usually have uh, other events like uh, the celebration of the uh, uh, King's Day. Uh, we have uh, afternoon on a Sunday afternoon at the beach, uh, silver uh, uh, tasting oysters uh, in of Northern California, and many other events. But uh, right now we kind of uh, stuck at home, so that's pretty much what we do. Any information is at uh, BCNC for Belgian Club of Northern California, BCNC.com. Any questions, you can always send it to pierre at bcnc.com or board at bcnc.com. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pierre. And thank you for thank you all. Before wrapping up this session, I would like to thank your audience today coming from all the US and in Belgium as well. And uh, thank your uh, panelists. Uh, uh, we had a great time with you. We had a lot of questions and we hope you had an informative time. Um, you will have the contact details on this slide if you want to engage more with us. Um, our next webinar will take place at the end of the month and will be featuring Stephen Chung, president of the World Trade Center of Los Angeles, and we will have as well the Trade Commissioner of our three regions in Belgium, and we will talk about economy and in the region of Southern California and the good place of Belgium in this economy. So the webinar of today will be available in replay very soon and we will get an email from us with the recap, the contact details and a link to subscribe to our mailing list. One more thing I would like to add, um, since the beginning of the crisis, we have published as well a list of Belgian businesses available in Soto, California. You will find it on our last posting on our Facebook page. So have a look at the businesses and tell us if you want to add yours on it. I think it's always nice to have a, a view on what is uh, happening here in California uh, with Belgium uh, owners. 
Thank you again for joining us. Uh, stay safe, of course, and do not hesitate to reach us on uh, social media or to my personal LinkedIn profile if we can be of any help for your business. Thank you, Solange. Thank you, Laurel. Thank you, Alain. Thank you, Pierre. And thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.